is coming. So we are back. I would like to give a huge warm welcome to Dr. Kami Haleski, all the way from the US and now based in Kentucky. So welcome, Kami. Thank you so much for having me. This is very nice. Oh, Kami, it's just such a pleasure. I've known you for many years and I just really enjoy you. I enjoy your perspective. I enjoy your lens. I enjoy your humanness. And that's why I reached out and asked if you would come speak to us on International Women's Day. So it's a real fit for me that you said yes. I was like, yay, Kami's coming. Um, because what you bring is probably what I think we're, I'm trying to achieve in terms of contribution, which is bringing us more together than apart. And the fact we have more in common than we have not. And I just feel like you've always shown up with those values. And today's talk um, for International Women's Day really just helps us all to navigate and to be more cami. So we're doing avoiding shaming humans this is whilst also speaking up for horses what's your story where would you like us to start i think i'm going to go a little bit into some of my background some of my history um, i was super lucky to grow up on a small horse farm we had uh anywhere from 15 to 20 horses while i was growing up and we raised arabian horses we trained all breeds of horses. We gave lessons to everybody from four years old to 74 years old. And it was, it was just a really amazing upbringing for what I ended up being passionate about. Um, I was probably a behavior geek before I even realized what my career path would be. I thought nothing of sitting out in the pasture for a few hours watching what the horses were doing. And I sort of thought that was a normal thing that all kids did, but now I realize that was not. And uh, I, you know, I got my master's degree right after my bachelor's degree in animal science and was very focused on like equine nutrition and exercise physiology and biomechanics. And it was all great. And I, I had a really nice teaching schedule at Michigan State University, but quite honestly people were not listening to my opinions about horse behavior or horse welfare and i eventually recognized i was going to have to get my phd if i really wanted people to listen i think the climate has changed a little since then this was the year 2000 so i worked with uh, dr Eduardo zanella whose home base is from brazil and um I emphasized actually studying people's attitudes towards animal welfare. And it was actually more towards farm animal welfare than horses during that time. But everywhere I could, I emphasized horse behavior and horse welfare. And Dr. Zanella was really good at getting me lined up with opportunities. So um, before ISES, ICES, Equitation Science, before that was even official, I was able to go to one of the Italian conferences. Uh, it was held in Milan and talk to just some amazing change makers about these passions I have towards horse behavior and welfare. Um, and then became very involved with equitation science launching. Uh, and, you know, since then I've just had some great opportunities. I really love the way that, I mean, I met you in Milan. That was when I first met you. And it was, we were really at this sort of new chapter of showing up for horses. Today, we're going to sh talk about showing up for horses. That doesn't mean that we have to become less, less human and less humane. And I think that's quite a really exquisite uh, rock, like balance. And um, I just think we, there's been so much happening. Now, you are a lecturer now, um, you know, bringing us right up to date. Your, what's your actual, is it, sorry, go on, you tell us. So I'm a senior lecturer at University of Kentucky, where I've been for the last four years. And uh, I have two major classes that I work on. One is equine industry issues, 
which lends itself very well to some of what we're going to talk about here. And then I, I co-teach our senior capstone class. But um, some of these issues that I believe we're going to talk about regarding the Gordon Elliott situation, the Kevin Lemke whip situation, those are both topics that we have talked about extensively in these classes this past week. Mm. So we're really on point, actually, and very current. So, you know, I really appreciate Cami taking the time to show up for us all in this climate and it's relevant and it's happening right now. So uh, Cami and I, we're both across this construct and it's it's actually unfolding every day. And this last week has been busy for both of us in terms of uh, public uh, perception and then we delve into something called a social license and that's about public um, approval and or rejection and then we've got this understanding that before we can be approved there might just be the construct of acceptance so this is called social licensing and we call it to operate equestrian sports we've had a few big ones haven't we this week cool blimey <laughs> <laughs> our brains are a little bit what what's that emoji that has the exploding brain <laughs> yeah yeah okay so which should, which one should we do first should we take the american one or the british one because like we're both between us we've got a leg in the, on either side of the pond haven't we on these stories right i don't i don't know that it matters but um I, just a smidge of background first of all uh I am being very vulnerable to all of you to try to do this without PowerPoint slides. That's a big stretch for me, but it seemed like the right thing to do for this particular talk. And in some regards, I would probably flip this on its head. I am much more, I'm much more wanting to speak up for the horse, quite honestly, than worry about whether or not I'm shaming people. If people don't know, I am all about educating them you know, educating them to learning theory, educating them to the sentience level of a horse. Uh, but if I think maybe they do know stuff, I don't want to go, I don't go out of my way to shame them, certainly. But if I think somebody is being evil or wrong, I, I have no problem calling them out if they're not doing right by horses. Okay, I'm just going to put this in the chat so we can like discuss around it. What we're talking about is accountability and that isn't shame and shaming. So being accountable for what how, how we show up and our behavior is very different from I am bad, which is what we were discussing a couple of talks ago about the difference. So accountability, do, do, what do you think about where we start? Is it, do you recommend your students start with their own accountability? Like we show up for being accountable to ourselves first? Well, and, and I, I don't know that everybody that is teaching these areas to undergraduate students does it the same. We start with a very long discussion about the difference between animal welfare and animal rights and, and trying to help people understand that they can have lots of concerns about a horse's quality of life um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, I'm going to go to an extreme level, that they want horses to have the right to vote. You know, there are ways that they can be ensuring a good quality of life and, and be very thoughtful about what's going on. I think, do you want me to go ahead and address one of the specific issues we've been thinking about? Yeah, one, yeah absolutely. So, one, me is that you you become more you cami and i think that's whatever you take us in every any direction you you want to okay so if and i actually chose not to show the clip or the picture that we're going to discuss all of you can look these up if you haven't already looked at them probably way too many times like i have so if we think about kevin lumpke the show jumper who was on a horse i believe the horse's name was good luck which is sort of intriguing already um, and the, we, we see this PETA video and I'll be honest, I, I'm not always friends with PETA's, uh, material, but in this case, this video clip needed to come out. So where it starts is we see six fairly significant, harsh whip cracks on this horse. Um, 
We don't see right what happened right before then. I suspect he refused a fence and or slightly reared up. And the rider was, in his mind, trying to put the horse in its place. Now, okay, I'm already concerned because positive punishment rarely does what we think it's going to. But even if I accept that, the fact even after he hears the whistle that he's done, he's been eliminated, he decides he's going to make that horse go over a fence. It's a big fence. It's a significant fence. Whatever is going on with that horse that day, whether it's physically or mentally, he's done. He's checked out. He doesn't even attempt to jump this. I've had Shetland ponies try harder to jump. He just runs straight through the fence. And, and my heart is absolutely broken watching this horse that quite honestly probably just went two years backwards in its training based on the rider not trusting that something was going wrong with the horse. Mm, so well said. Okay, did you, I mean, we've got reactions happening now and Menk has put in the chat, I don't know what actually these situations. So we're just, we're, you've given us a really good description. So that's, that's brought us all up to speed. Um, when we talk about being accountable and we've got the video being released from with a, an organization with their own agenda and we've got a rider showing up as a professional so he's not an amateur rider where like in terms of these scales of morality and do no harm to horses so we've got you know peter or saying, you know, actually do no harm and, you know, FEI and the United States Equestrian Federation show up. That's, that's what's been invited to do from both of them. And we've got the professional rider. Did you dig in with your students into his apology? And, you know, how is this all trans, how is it ha un unraveling in the US? Uh, and, and I think, you know, there were actually a fair number of my students that had not seen the video yet. So we needed to show the video and kind of dissect what was happening. Um, some of them are at the point in their program where they actually haven't had the learning theory lectures yet. So then we had to digress and spend a little bit of time on learning theory and why rarely would that positive punishment be the most effective thing to do. Um, and, and then I kind of went back to a little bit of my history you know, one thing that would happen to me frequently when I was in Michigan is I would have a concern such as this. And quite honestly, I would run into more women than men that would tell me I was being overly sensitive and I should be quiet and keep my opinions to myself because the horse world was already under enough scrutiny. I didn't need to bring the bad stuff out to be examined. And I was so excited when Julie Fiedler presented her social license to operate material in Australia in 2017, I think. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a thing. I, I can be upset about behaviors, especially from people that truly should know better. And this honesty and, and transparency and accountability so we, we spend a lot of time with the students trying to understand this concept of social license to operate and then addressing basically the, the story of the week that, that happens to represent, all right, we can't keep doing this. It's sort of like handing PETA things on a silver platter to say, uh, yeah, I kind of understand why you guys have some reasons to be upset with us right now. That silver platter and how we're sort of, um, well, you nailed it. You just said about know better. You know, what happens when we know better and we do the same? I think Peter all, were all over that uh, video. But, you know, when we actually know better, what about that gap to do better? And can we just, um, you know, it's great that you brought in the social licensing. So, you know, this is about all of us showing up to now we know better what can we do we've I've made mistakes you know I've got my hand up I am flawed I have done things to horses my horse that I uh, that kept me awake at night after I'd used I thrashed my horse under instruction from a coach uh, it, to jump into a water jump
guilt of what I did, I would never ever be on the trajectory that I'm on now. Like the whole showing up for horse welfare, you know, being the change our horses need. I was the problem. So, you know, we are the solution and I, you know, I'm my own solution. What has happened now, now the video is released, now that, you know, uh, I, I have seen an apology from Kevin, the, the, the professional. He said, I wanted to ask your opinion, you know, what did you think when you read in the apology, he said he was sorry to his horse. Like that was the first line I read, and it really resonated with me that he actually wanted to let us all know maybe for Peter, I don't know, but he told his horse he was sorry. Like, where is that lying for you? How is it sitting? And in part, to be honest, uh, the Gordon Elliott thing took off before I had fully had a chance to analyze the Kevin Lumkey thing. Um, I would need to see him saying it personally to have an intuitive feeling of whether does he really mean he's sorry? And quite honestly, telling your horse sorry 24 hours later, the horse has no idea. Um, if he was sincere, if he means to be better, um, I, I'd be willing to watch him and see. But unfortunately, my experience over many, many years of watching horse people and particularly horse trainers is that they're prepared to do that in an open forum where they know cameras are going, unfortunately it means worse stuff is happening at the home farm. And, mm -hmm. and I used to go to some of the horse shows and I would on purpose go to the warm up pens at like midnight or one in the morning to watch what was happening. And, and some of it was completely horrifying. And I don't understand, you know, part of the problem is this horse, this magnificent blessed creature responds to punishment in a way that rewards us. Mm. And that is super unfortunate for horses. You know, whereas a, a, a decent number of dogs would shut down, a decent number of these horses ends up giving us the performance that was desired. And, mm. and that, like if, if I think about Arabian halter horse training, unfortunately, the horse that is terrified of the handler ends up looking gorgeous for the show ring. And, and so we accidentally reward the wrong thing. You've just lit up the chat actually, which is lovely. So that Gail's popped in. Yes, behind the scenes scenario can be very horrible. So we're sort of, we're sort of delaying this. We're saying, you know, you opened it up by saying, if that's what we're getting with all, and the rider knows the cameras are on, you know, and he did say, actually, I read his apology and he said, you know, he totally lost, he, he'd lost his emotionality. He was, it, he had lost his shit, basically. And we all got to witness that. What I think is really interesting as well is um, this, what Steph's brought up, Steph Bloom says about, you know, it's hard to get to change. So, and she's put a spotlight on, but never shame. Now, shaming, we know, doesn't create change. That, that's the point, isn't it? Like, shame begets shame and guilt does if it's going to have any effect like my experience put me on a course of change and it put me specifically down the path that really fits me which is looking at evidence-based knowledge to optimize horse welfare so you know so that's really interesting what where are we at with given you said you would happily watch his practices will he ha has he had any sanctions has he had any punitive um consequence to his actions through the do you know at all or not i mean i know he got excused from the ring for excessive use of the stick and then my mm -hmm. understanding is when he went ahead and attempted to jump that next jump it was sort of like he got double excused yeah then like i said the <laughs> the gordon elliott thing lit up like basically the next day and i ended up moving my my so-called spare time toward that so I haven't had a chance to dig back into, did they do any long-term sanctions with Gordon Elliott or, yeah. or is that kind of a done thing? 
Okay, so the Gordon Elliott, let's shift on to the UK. Let's come over here. I say the UK, he's actually an Irish uh, horse trainer, very successful horse trainer, has many, many racehorses in his, tra like in his yard training. Um, so what this was more about was actually the, uh, the, the image, the moral outrage. I think we have to tie these two together with the through line of moral outrage. Now they're totally different images in terms of one is in video, like it's a video playing out. Another is a static photograph. And um, there's this language, there's a whole field of ascetic force. So it's like an image and it can have negative or positive responses. So when we saw the image of the, the famous, famous racehorse trainer sitting astride a, a deceased horse, at the gallop, so there is context there that he died at the gallops with his fingers up. It caused, a, I mean, that's why I know you got taken off the Kevin uh, moral outrage because it was like it got trumped with um, this, this um, I guess I'm gonna use a language of horror and shock. Like I actually, when I first saw it, I thought it was Photoshopped. Like I honestly yeah, thought that was a Photoshop photo. Did you? What, did, can you remember your first reaction when you saw it? Um, I'm trying to remember because I almost feel like I was out to dinner with other people, so I I was in a position where I couldn't process it. But I remember actually making a gas and somebody asking, "What's going on?" And I'm like, "I I can't deal with this right now. I, I'm going to close my phone and and come back to this later." Okay, um, well, I. Sorry, go on. sorry. No, go ahead. I, I was, it, I was being people contacting me, and I looked at the image, and I just thought, look, there's no state. There was a delay from the image being released, so out of his control, to an actual statement, which where he verified Gordon Elliott very that that was not a Photoshop. In that space before we got the verification, I thought the Peter, the anti-racing, we're, we're back to, in England, we're about to head up to Cheltenham race. Like we've got some really high-profile race, races coming up, the Grand National. You know, it would cause quite a lot of um, now is a good time to really put the sport into disrepute. So I thought, oh, this is Photoshop. No one would be that like this is a no brainer. This is not real. And this will this will just be blown up. Well, the, the, the Sunday, last Sunday, um, it came out as confirmed and it was real. Now, at that point. That's when I felt the outrage. Like it was the whole, you know, I'm galloping away with the disrespect of, you know, everything, who he is. You know, when we talk about what's the difference between shame and guilt, it was like the two had just mashed into it. Like for me, it, I, I really struggled that he was different to his behavior. That if you could sit across a deceased horse at the gallops on your watch, a bit like what you said about Kevin, how do we know what, what you would do when we're not watching? And I, I couldn't get my head. I was really in this moral outrage of bringing the sport into disrepute. The fact that, you know, we there was a massive backlash of racing horse lovers saying, this is not what we do. It was fascinating, I thought, Cammy, how internally he got outed. Gordon Elliott was totally outed. Did you like notice that? Did you see that happening from the US or not really? Well, a lot of my material has still come from across the pond. I mean, that's another part of this social license piece is we all have access to all sorts of social media and layperson news articles, um, you know, almost all the time. So I had all these conflicting things going in my mind. And, and of course, my colleagues, both in Kentucky and around the world, we're going crazy with, with wanting feedback and conversation and so forth. So on the one hand, you've got some people saying, okay, let's calm down. The horse was already dead. This person did not abuse the horse. Why are you people so freaked out? And, and then we had the other side that is saying, all right, this is complete cavalier disregard for thinking of the horse as an animal, as a living being, you know, the whole callousness of just plunking yourself down on top of the horse, obviously posing for a picture where 
he can say a million times that he was trying to make a sign, just wait a second. I've now asked a bunch of people from Ireland, is two fingers how you guys say wait a second? No, it's not. And and so it's like, what possessed you in that moment to have such total disregard for this animal that you're willing to make make light of it? Mm. Let's let's just pause there. That was okay. So you're you're bringing me nicely on this timeline of photos released, no attachment to it. Then comes the statement of ownership, and it isn't photoshopped. And then we get, and I guess probably this was always, you know, for us there's been a lot. It's a fast moving story. So I look back then, and I definitely knew that that was an insult. The whole the the way there was an explanation i did think in hindsight he got the wrong publicity team behind him it lacked vulnerability which is what we've been talking about all throughout this whole conference about showing up owning our flaws and you know if we'd got that for second statement um straight away which was it was i lost my brain like i made a mistake i have no idea what was going through my head I, I, what I, you know, I, this is not who I am, but my behavior at this point made this, this is outrageous. If he'd owned that at that time, at the same time as the photo and all the sort of, but he didn't. And that was really what I think then gave fuel to what then happened. Cause we're going to talk about shame and shaming. And I think, you know, the whole, the fact he didn't take ownership right away that he did something bad rather than he is bad. Does that make sense, Kami? Yes, yes. And we see, we see famous people do flawed behaviors all the time. Um, you know, and again, it, like, I have a talk with my students every year about, and this could derail us completely, but I'm hoping to keep it sort of in control. I try to explain them. I don't think that equine slaughter is the worst thing in the world. I definitely think neglect is a far, far worse thing for a horse. Um, but I still believe that the horse can go through that situation and and be treated respectfully. You know, it's sort of like with our with our first people here in the U.S. When they kill an animal to go towards providing food. There, there's a moment of prayer where they acknowledge the gift that animal gave. And, and that may not be our spiritual experience, but anytime you have a person or a group of people kind of making fun of a dead animal, I just don't understand. And I found that picture reminded me a lot of, of some of the trophy hunter pictures that have been leaked the last few years. Um, I think you can hunt an animal without making fun of its death. Okay, so we know this is out there. It's moral outrageous. I mean, you know, the whole industry now is, uh, like the whole racing industry is in disrepute. What I think happens now is we're waiting to hear the punishment, the punitive action from the Irish uh, horse racing or board. So that needed to happen. Now that didn't come out until Friday. So we're looking at, you know, this is only three days ago. We actually got final confirmation. What I thought was really notable for social licensing is the British Horse Racing Association actually stepped in, BHA, and they said, we are now putting you on a, um, a ban of racing in the UK until we hear what sanctions, what action is going to happen. So everyone knew they had to show up as with a consequence, like use learning theory. What I thought was really interesting is um, the space between the weight, the weight, my God, every day from from um, Gordon Elliott take the first statement, then there's the second statement that comes out early on in the week, and then we're all waiting for him to receive his punishment, and then we get then it starts to get really um, like it's inhuman it's dehumanizing the language that he was uh, people were targeting with you know he was totally uh, i was worried for his mental health actually um you know i had the same moral outrage as everyone else and then i started to see the backlash and the 
absolute um, bit shaming. I mean, when you say somebody is bad, you are shaming. And I, I was really uncomfortable at that point. And I just thought this, we're, we're trying to wait. We're, we're in this space before him for him to get his punishment, but uh, based on the whole sport. And now everyone was going for it. Where did you sit? What? How did you navigate that time before he got his punishment? Uh, yeah, it has been an interesting road to follow. Um, you know, certainly at first there was this moral outrage that said, "Why? Why would you do something like that? So disrespectful." And then at some point, you start to think, all right, this is the, I hate to pick on teenage boys. This is sort of the ignorant thing that a teenage boy might do. And, but at some point, you have to sanction that person and then move on. Um, there are certainly trainers and riders out there that have thrashed horses and caused live horses far more suffering. So, I hate what he did. I hate what it symbolizes. It's a very callous approach. And yet, once again, it may be that the punishment is worse than the crime. Okay. Um, we, that's, I mean, the punishment's now come out. So he's had a 12 month suspension. Sorry, uh, suspended for six months, a 12 month ban from racing, suspended for six months, a 15,000 euro fine. What I was interested in is his response. I was worried about his mental health. I wanted to know what this would look like going forwards. And he really owned in that second after the punishment was dealt. So on Friday, another statement he released, which was, I did something really bad, like really bad. And he owned that. I have put my sport that I love and all the people I care about into distress. Um, and I think that was something that I needed to hear from, from the get-go, to be honest. It was it should have been the first thing he'd done. But it came out, and then I thought, if you read the actual statement, he's got a chance. And this is why I have that word hope. He said he's got a chance. Well, he didn't say that. There is a chance that how he now responds to this whole adversity will actually improve racing. He wants to be given the opportunity to improve the sport publicly you know to be seen publicly and he he wants a chance he said it'll take time but to do better what's the point knowing better and then not doing better and i think this is why i love mistakes i love flaws i love failures because it's always how we choose to respond and now where how, how can we all take something from that cami what's your advice for us all Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's a tough one with a lot of layers to it. Um, I do think there's, a, there's an element, you know, many times I don't tend to think about this female piece, male piece. And yet when you get down to levels of empathy, you know, you're, you're far less likely to have a female trainer find herself in that same situation. We have plenty of articles out there that show like male vet students tend to have significantly less empathy than female vet students. So I do think there's this empathy level. And if he has, if it's not just words, if he has legitimately uh, become more sensitized and more empathetic, there, there might be a silver lining to, um, to help the racing industry, but, you know, unfortunately, in the short run, there was a lot of negative publicity to the racing industry, which can ill afford any negative impact. Mm. He's getting quite. If we go to the if we go to the thread now, there's been loads of you chatting, and I did. I was aware of everyone's comments. I just think that at this point, just to finish the story for Gordon Elliott, he has been. He's been given a punishment, and he's chosen to uh, say he will come back and do better and be a better human. So straight away, I feel far more at ease that um, we are showing up in our humanness. That I mean, 
you know, when we talk about positive reinforcement is not just for horses, I don't want to be going around, um, you know, the consequences are significant because of the actions. And I do believe that personally. And I do believe in being a better person and learning from mistakes. However, let's go to some of the chat. Let's have a look. Uh, Steph said, uh, actions, not identity. So, you know, actually owning our actions doesn't mean we are, that's who we are. He's owned the action that that was absolutely outrageous. And you know, for me, like, we're listening and we're like, what a no brainer. Like what, he just had nothing between, like what happened in that moment? To Gail saying, just because you are successful does not justify the process. To Jan saying, how could this, his actions possibly be justified? I don't know if anyone is actually, well, sorry, Gordon Elliott tried to justify, didn't he? That was the first statement. So um, I think he's got a different PR company with him now. Um, say he fell when the horse died. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, I wonder if his later statements were sincere. Do you know what? We won't know until until time, will we, Cammy? Time will tell. Time will answer this. Um, in the meantime, how will the sport stand up? How resilient is racing after this absolute deceased debacle? Ah, uh, that's an interesting one. During 2019, when Santa Anita, California was having all the catastrophic breakdowns, uh, I had some students collecting data. I worked with a couple other colleagues to put out an article on social license to operate and thoroughbred racehorse welfare, where we dug into these situations. Um, for myself, I am just as content with horses welfare in the racing world, if we take a holistic approach, as I am with horses in the show horse world. Um, I, th I think there's lots of good things. Obviously, there's some bad things. But because of the betting public, because of things being televised, the racing world is under so much more scrutiny than other mm -hmm. sub-disciplines of the horse world. So, you know, every time something like this happens, I, I sort of have a catch in my throat because, you know, from a selfish standpoint, I work at a university that is extremely dependent on the racing industry being healthy. And, uh, you know, we, we've seen what happened to the Greyhound racing industry. Mm -hmm. And so you always sort of wonder, are we just one bad story away from flat racing being done? I hope that's mm -hmm. not the case. I still think there's more good than bad by a long shot. Nice. Maybe the jury's out. We don't, that's the whole point. Even with Gordon Elliott, why can't we just suspend it and see what action he takes? And and also for all of us, like when I say we're all the problem, we're also all the solution. So um, great question from Susan. Thank you, Susan. Cami, you said that you would not have a problem calling someone out if there was, if they were out of line with a horse. Can you give an example of how you have handled different acute situations? Ooh. And yeah, Susan, you're right. That's, that is a challenging situation. Um, for a fair number of years now, I've been more of a horse show mom to my daughter's horse shows. I haven't actually shown probably in about seven years. And when I go to those different shows, it is almost inevitable that I will see something happening in the warm up pen that I'm uncomfortable with. Um, I've had a few times where it was actually little kids being harsh and horrible to their horse or their pony. And if I can figure out which riding instructor they're attached to, uh, on a few occasions, I have gone over and I said, um, I'm really very uncomfortable with how, you're, how this person you're giving lessons to is yanking on that pony's mouth. Um, is, is there a chance you could give them some different tools to work with that pony in a different way? Now, most of the time in a competition environment, people are not very receptive to hearing that information. But every once in a while, probably, probably one that's more likely to be received positively is a trainer is busy with one student over at a different ring, and I happen to see another student in a warm-up pen really not being fair to that horse, especially if it's an instructor I already know, 
they will often be appreciative of being told, hey, you really need to work on your youngster's understanding of learning theory. But if this is a, a big ticket, big time trainer, um, they don't want they don't want to hear what I'm going to say. No. I, I've got to, I mean, Susan, that's helped me bring some things I wanted to talk about at some point today. But like, I like the phrasing of tapping out. I think I have certainly tapped out of hard conversations. It was too hard, too difficult. I, I talk about it in my ebook um, about social licensing for horses, um, sorry, for coaches navigating the 21st century. And I think I have absolutely tapped out of having that hard conversation. But what I didn't expect from tapping out to go into my comfort, what I didn't expect is then how that would eat at me. And I didn't, I thought if by not having that difficult, hard conversation with the coach who's asking a 13 year old to thrash her pony on at where I keep my horse, like I just tapped out of it. I just chose not to. And that I couldn't, I made that was a real, another defining moment that actually I didn't like myself tapping out. I didn't actually like who I was by doing that tap out, which was so easy to do. And I just walked away and I came back, I discussed it with my husband. And he's like, if there was a dog in the street being kicked in the guts, do you think this is like people walking past would just ignore it? And I was like, oh God. So we've got this social construct of, you know, it's okay to, to actually, you know, punish hope. It's like, why would a 13 year old, be asked by her coach to thrash her pony for refusing offence. Like it's all not, I tapped out basically, I tapped out of a hard conversation. I'm not judging whether you tap out or not. What I'm doing is sharing how that guilt of me tapping out has put me on this path to show up and have hard, no, none of this is easy. Would you agree, Cammy? None of this is, None of this is a free pass, showing up for horses, showing up for people. Yeah, absolutely. And there are times where I have to turn away from the situation because my emotional energy is not at the place where I can address that right in that situation, or I don't feel very convinced I'm going to make a difference. So there are many times where I say, Okay, three quarters of my energy towards helping horse welfare is going to be what I do in terms of teaching students where I will definitely have an impact or things I do with the International Society for Equitation Science where I know I can have an impact. Um, those direct face-to-face -face scenarios, I have to kind of pick and choose when I actually think I can have an impact. Just pause there. I think we can all relate to that. I, I, you know, when you say you pick and choose, I actually think it's a bit like looking at your own battery and looking at your bit like my phone. I need to look at my phone, look at myself, and go, okay, I'm eighty percent charged. I can show up and and not. I'm I'm going to actually show up for this conversation because, however, however it pans out, if it takes my battery from eighty percent to one percent. I have enough in it to, to show up. But when I've got like, you know, if I'm functioning on 10%, I can't, I, I need to self care. Like I need to put my battery, my lack of battery first. And I think this is the bit where we don't really talk about this. We don't really talk about the importance for us to be in a space where we can help more horses by actually being charged and you know, like the fact you're showing up, like we're here today, we're having these hard conversations. Maybe this is it. Maybe just having hard conversations is where we do the work. Well, and maybe perhaps as a final point, uh, one thing I did not address early on is my passion for helping working equids in developing parts of the world, whether it's working horses, working mules, working donkeys. And, Given that that is roughly 80% of the world equine population, if I can make their lives a tiny bit better, um, you know, if we're talking about total help for equids, I perhaps do more good there 
than than helping a couple of ponies at, at a local show. So I'd love to say I help all of them whenever I can. Um, but nice. but that would be that that would be an untruth. Yeah, I think this is lovely comments here, Cami. Good point, Cami, from Susan. Deciding where to have an impact. That's gorgeous. That's really that's um, valuing the nuance of all of us. Pick your battles from Yasmin. Uh, Jill says yes. Love that analogy. Gail's put here. Choosing where you can make a difference is really important for us. Great point, Cami. Uh, we can't change the world, so we do need to focus on what we personally can make a difference, um, and then we where we have an impact. This has gorgeously wrapped up ready for our next speaker who his title is how what to expect when you improve the world and i just think this is so nice that we can have these hard like we dug into two really high profile on point um it, scenarios really i mean that they're, they're, they're still unfolding certainly the gordon Elliott one is still unfolding although it's really i don't know if you've all noticed but since he got his since Gornelli got his punishment, the 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 everyone's been calmed. Did you have you noticed that? That's really interesting. It's definitely swelled down, yeah. Mm, swelled down. That's that's a better way. Oh, that's a really really great conversation to have, and I've learned so much about just when to be able to show up and when when it's when we have to tap out because that's when it's important to see where we make a difference. And, you know, women, International Women's Day has really been about celebrating women who make a difference. And Kami, I really just want to thank you for all the work you do, both with at home, so in the US and in third world countries for horses and donkeys. Um, it really means, look at all the love coming for you, all the claps, all the love, all the blue hearts, here they come. Um, I just really want to say thank you because you've taken time out of your, your busy day and um, we can all, you know, do better, I think. And um, I love the fact we're, we're a community and we can support each other to do better. So thank you. All right, thank you, Lisa, for having me. You and you didn't do any slides, no PowerPoint. <laughs> Absolutely, you're smashing it. Um, gorgeous, thank you so much, Cami. I, I hope you stay around and join us, Cami, if you can. We're gonna move on to Jan, and um, I'm gonna have this break now, and we'll see you all at, it's my gonna be my two o'clock. Okay, Bye. sounds good, bye.